Good morning. The sun has risen in Connect Arab. Hey, it's good to see everybody this morning. Um, if you don't know me, my name's Gary. I'm the Connections Pastor here. And part of what I deal with um, and do is life group stuff. And so January is a time where churches everywhere talk about vision and refocus and all of those good things. And, and Matt started us off last week with that, talking about God's purpose for the church and how God shows grace and love and mercy to the church so that the church can show that out into the community and out into the world. And we're going to continue in that line of thinking today. We're going to talk about life groups. We're going to talk about why we do life groups and, and what are they for and, and what benefit are they to us. And I, I want to give a couple of um, caveats right off the bat. So you're going to hear things in the sermon today and you're going to, see like, you're going to think, well, that sounds like church. And it is because corporate worship and life groups work together. You don't separate those things. Um, if you want to have a full, um, rounded, if you want to call it that, relationship with Christ, growing in the body of Christ, corporate worship is a part of that, and then a small group setting is a part of that. And so some of these things, it's going to be like, wait a minute, that kind of sounds like church. It's both. That kind of sounds like uh, corporate worship. It's both. And I'm going to encourage you today. Obviously, we're going to focus on life groups, and I just want you to be open to that. Some of you have never been a part of a life group here at Connect. And so that's a big part of what we do. We want to connect people to God. We want to connect people to the community. We want to connect people to the world through missions. And the way that we connect to others and community is through our life groups. And I'm just going to, next week we're going to talk about missions, but we have a church member that's going on a mission trip this coming week. Heather Metcalf is going to Kenya, right? And I don't know, you're going to be going, what, 10 days, 12 days, something like that. So I want you to just take a moment. We're going to pray for Heather. We're going to pray for the kids because Tim's going to be responsible for them <laughs> for a little while. Um, I would say we'd pray for Tim, but, you know, some things lost cause. So <laughs> no, in all seriousness, let's, let's pray. Um, and I hope that you'll continue to pray over the week and, and days to come for Heather as she's traveling and, and going there to Africa to minister to others. So let's pray. God, I come before you today. I lift up Heather and the trip and everything that's going on with that, the, the preparation and all the other people that are involved. Lord, you know all the details. I thank you for Heather's openness and willingness. And we've heard her talk about wanting to go uh, to Africa, and so this opportunity is now here. And Lord, I just pray that you guard her heart, that you guard her uh, well-being, that the travel is as smooth as international travel can be. God, that her heart is just open to whatever you lead her to, that she's able to minister to people while she's there, but mostly, God, that she's able to hear your voice, receive your grace. God, that her heart will be changed, that her life will be changed from this point forward because of what you do and because of what she is able to do there in that ministry. Thank you, God, for her willingness, for her faithfulness to go. I pray for Tim and the kids as they're here. Uh, Lord, may they uh, everything go smoothly with them, school and health and all of those good things. God, may they all be just keenly aware of your hand upon them. And may your grace and your peace just fill them each and every day. Thank you for your faithfulness and for the opportunity to serve you and serve others as we live out our faith here. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 2 today as we talk about life groups. We're going to look at uh, some things that the early church did. And sometimes we want to look at the early church and, and what's going on in Acts, and we want to kind of romanticize that and make it like something that it's not. That church had problems as well, but... The Holy Spirit was working through them, and they were open to that, and they were loving God and loving others, and a lot of what you see is them living that out, 
And so we're just going to look at a few things today that we see in Acts chapter 2. If you got your, your phone, your iPad, whatever, you can go to the YouVersion um, app there and you can see the notes. If you're watching online, you can put in the zip code 35016 and you can pull up those notes. This text that we're going to read, it comes right on the heels of what's known as the day of Pentecost. Peter preaches this sermon and at the end of it, Scripture says about 3,000 people were added to the church. About 3,000 people came to faith in Christ, and this church went from about 120 people to over 3,000, like that, overnight. My goodness. And then you start to read how there's some issues that they have to deal with as they're, they're handling that. But God moved in a miraculous way, and the text that we're going to read comes right on the heels of that. So Acts chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 42 and read down through verse 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to, breaking, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. So not only did 3,000 people get added at the end of the day of Pentecost, but day by day, as these believers were living out their faith, growing in their faith, more and more people were coming to Christ. So what are some things that we can learn about small groups, life groups, just from what we see in this text? The first thing is this. Life groups provide us an opportunity to focus on essentials. Life groups provide us an opportunity to focus on essentials. Look at the very first part of verse 42. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And then it lists these other things, that they devoted themselves to. That phrase there, devoted themselves, it means continued steadfastly. It means they were serious about this. They were serious and they were dedicated to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread and prayers. Continued steadfastly. Now sometimes, sometimes when a new year comes, we, we start and we say, hey, I'm going to read through the Bible this year. And we make it to about now, and it's like, whoa, some of those early, uh, early chapters and things, that's a little bit hard to get to, and it's hard to continue steadfastly through that. How do you do that? It's just a commitment. It's not that you, it's just like anything else in your life that requires persistence and requires um, dedication to, that sometimes you don't feel like it, but yet you still do it. Sometimes, if we're being honest, you don't feel like coming to church on a Sunday. Sometimes you don't feel like going to life group on a Sunday or a Wednesday or whatever, whenever time it is. But you make a commitment to it and you do it. Sometimes you don't feel like going to work on a Monday morning or a Tuesday morning or a Wednesday morning. or a, You know, but you do it. Sometimes you don't feel like going to the gym. Whatever the case might be, you still do those things. And that's kind of the idea of continued steadfastly. There was some persistence there. And what were they persistent about? What, what is the apostles' teaching? Who are the apostles? Those are the guys that walked with Jesus. And this, it, what's going on here, is about two months after the resurrection. So these guys who walked with Jesus, who saw his ministry, who were taught by the Lord, they were the ones teaching these people. Now that kind of sets the bar a little high. I mean, 
Matt can't live up to that. He didn't walk with the Lord in that sense physically. I didn't do that. We have the scriptures today, and we walk with the Lord in that sense, and we have the Holy Spirit within us. And Jesus even promised the, the, the apostles in John 14, 26 that the Holy Spirit was going to come, and he was going to teach them all things, and he was going to remind them of everything Jesus had said to them. Those are the things that were being taught. That's the apostles' teaching that the people were committed to and devoted to. We call that today the Word of God. So in our sense today, we're, we're committed to, devoted to, the Word of God, hearing the Word of God, studying the Word of God. Does that happen in the corporate sense? Yes, it does. When you come here on Sundays, you are going to hear sound biblical teaching. But you're also going to get that in small groups. You're going to get different topics in different ways. But you're going to get it in a smaller setting than what we have in a big corporate setting. So apostles' teaching is the first thing they were devoted to. Learning, understanding the doctrines of God. They were devoted to fellowship. And that's just partnership. That's gathering together. I mean, that means exactly the way we use that word today. That's what it means. Devoted to gathering together, to partnering together. The breaking of bread. That has a couple of meanings. It refers to the Lord's Supper. But also in a culture where having meals together was extremely important and it conveyed a far more meaning than what we might think of it today, it also meant that. That they're gathering in homes and they're breaking bread together. They're sharing a meal together. That happens a lot in life groups. Some people would say that's the reason we have life groups. So we can, uh, you know, have a, have a meal. But that's a part of it. And then the last thing is prayers. They're devoting themselves to prayers. Again, do we pray in a corporate sense? Yeah, we do. We prayed for Heather. We pray for one another. We, the worship teams pray, praise in the back before the service starts. We pray over the service. But in a life group, the prayers are different. You can be open about what you're dealing with or things that's going on in your family or workplace. You can be more honest. Is, I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but you can be a little bit more vulnerable. Now, obviously, that doesn't happen the first time you show up at a life group. That would be weird. But after you've been there for a while, just like everything else, it takes time. But you're going to be ministered to through prayer, through the opportunities for that, through discussing what the Bible says about something, through fellowshipping in a way that you're not ever going to get in a corporate setting. I don't know how to be more blunt about that. If all you do is come to church on Sunday morning, you're missing out. You're missing out. So life groups provide us an opportunity to focus on essentials, doctrine, prayer, fellowship, breaking of bread. The next thing is that life groups are where relationships are forged. What do I mean by relationships? I'm talking about getting to know people more. Like you can come to church on a Sunday morning, you can come every Sunday morning, you can come in, you can have the normal little greetings that, that we have, and then you can leave, and you can never really know anybody here, and also nobody here really knows you. When my wife and I moved to Arab back in 2019, I, we had been serving a church, I'd been pastoring bivocationally for about seven years. We decided, you know, when we moved, we were going to visit a lot of different churches, a lot of different formats, if you want to call it that way, a lot of different styles, and we did. I don't know how many churches we visited around here. Then COVID happened, you know, and all that weirdness. But I know that in our lives, we were a little unsettled, even though we were here and we were working and 
and we were doing the things that we normally do, and we were going to church on Sundays, but it's almost like you're standing at a window looking in, watching something else going on that you're not really a part of. Because you can come into a church, like I said, you can be there, you can speak to a couple of people around you, the service is over and you leave, and you're not really a part. And there's no real relationship there. Look at verse 44. All who believed were together. The phrase there, were together, and you're going to see it talk about being together more often. It it basically means they're in the same place. But it's the idea of they're on the same page. They're of the same mind. They're working in the same direction. They're, They're in the same place, not just physically, but Mentally and spiritually, they're, they're working together. They are together. And they had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Let me just stop there and give you this little sidebar. That is not socialism. Some people will take that verse and go, see, even Christians and Jesus was a socialist. And that is not what that is saying. If you'll read that, you'll see that the people were using their possessions and they were using them in a way to meet the needs that they saw in the way that God led them to. There wasn't some other entity, the government, saying, you can't have that, we're going to take that from you and we're going to distribute that to these other people. That's a very broad definition of what socialism is, all right? So don't let somebody go, yeah, well, the early church, you read Acts. I mean, they were socialists there. They were like living in a commune. That's not what that's saying. They're taking their own private property, and they are meeting the needs of people around them that they see in a way that God has led them to do. That's what we're called to do also. God doesn't bless you just so you can hoard as much as possible. Go read the parable about the man building bigger barns. God blesses you so that you can, with an open hand, bless others. And you do that by seeing the need that's around you and meeting needs where you can. All right, that was free. We'll go back to life groups. Let's see. Uh, They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. That last part right there really helps you understand what's going on in verse 45. Why were they able to sell their possessions and meet the needs of others? Because they had generous hearts. Because they had glad and generous hearts. They weren't being stingy or selfish and holding on to things so tightly. And out of that generosity, they're able to bless others. Life groups are where needs like that, resources like that can be discussed, can be shared. Life groups are where action can take place to meet needs. Again, everybody knows the bigger the organization or the entity, the slower it is to move. A life group can see a need, meet a need, before the corporate body of the church can do anything. There's got to be meetings, you know, depending on your church structure, you got to have committees and all that kind of stuff. Life groups are where these things can happen. And be discussed. Life groups are where the togetherness that this text is talking about is cultivated and acted out. It's where you realize that you're not alone in this. It's where you realize that the things that you're going through and dealing with, other people are going through those and dealing with those things also. Or they already have. And they're able to show you grace and peace and teach you how they got through that. What the Lord did in their lives. Life groups are where those things happen. Life groups are where you find your tribe to use. I guess that's the kind of language we use today. You find your people. 
And it happens in a way, and the relationships are built in a way where you find people who you can depend on. You find people that you know will pray for you, that you can share something in a vulnerable way, and they're not going to gossip about you and talk about you. They're going to pray for you, and they're going to walk with you through that. Life groups are where that's happening. Now, a lot of people come to church corporate. When I say church, I'm talking about, you know, the big gathering on Sunday morning. And they're wanting that kind of relationship. But they're wanting the pastor to be, have that relationship with them. And it's impossible. A church our size, Matt, cannot have that kind of relationship with every person here. It's impossible. It's humanly impossible. And then as the church grows... It becomes really impossible. And so what happens is you come to church and you don't become a part of a life group, but you're still wanting that kind of relationship and you're wanting to get that from Matt. And it doesn't happen because it's impossible. And so you get mad and you say, I'm not being fed there and you leave. Now I realize I'm speaking to the choir because y'all are here. But y'all have seen that play, that play out over time. Matt's been in ministry long enough. I guarantee you he's seen that happen. I've been in ministry long enough. I've seen that happen. And when you try to say, hey, are you a part of a Sunday school? Are you a part of a life group? Well, no, I don't have time for that. Well, I don't know what to say. You're looking for something that's never going to happen. And you want the pastor and just so you know, Matt didn't say, hey, say this this morning. <laughs> he didn't. I'm just speaking from experience. You want the pastor to know everything that's going on in your life intimately, and he doesn't. Here, here's, a, here's a story. Where I pastored, there was a family there, an old, older family, that would never tell you when they were sick or going to be in the hospital. Never. But they would get mad if you didn't come see them when they were sick and in the hospital. Guess how I was supposed to find that out? By some spy stuff, I guess. <laughs> and so somebody would come to me and go, hey, did you know that so-and-so was in the hospital? No, I had no idea. And sometimes they'd be there and gone before I ever even knew about it. And then they would be chapped over it. What am I supposed to do? A pastor is not a psychic. He's not going to know that stuff. Your small group would know that. You would, you would tell them. If you weren't there, they would be able to check on you. I'm just saying there's relationship things that happen in a life group that are never going to happen in this room right here on Sunday mornings. And I hope you realize that I'm saying that not out of, you know, I'm not trying to shame you or anything. I'm, I'm saying that out of a place of love and what is best for us. There's relationships there that you're never going to have and that Matt is never going to be able to fill that spot on Sunday mornings. Maybe if there was only 10 or 20 of us here, he could do that. But I hope nobody's heart here is, you know, could we blow this church up enough that there's only 10 people coming here? That would not be good. Relationships are forged in life groups. The last point I want to bring to you this morning is that life groups are an opportunity to strengthen our faith and witness. Life groups are an opportunity to strengthen our faith and witness. What do I mean by that? A couple of different things. My wife used to have a saying when the kids were younger and at home, and they're dealing with stuff at school, and then, you know, they come home, and they're, you know, sometimes at each other and, and attacking each other with words and all that kind of stuff, and she would have this thing about, hey, home is a safe place. You have to deal with all of that other stuff at school or at band practice or wherever, 
You got to deal with people making fun of you and, and people saying derogatory things and people attacking you and all of that everywhere else. But at home, it's not going to be like that. Home is a safe place. And it's also, on the other side of that, it's a place where you can be honest and vulnerable. You can talk about what's going on. The same thing applies to life groups. Life groups are a safe place where in a smaller setting you can talk about, you can confess sin, you can be prayed for, you can pray for others. That's the way the Bible talks about things, that we confess sins one to another and we pray for one another. Not that you broadcast your life out in front of everybody, but in a small group of people that you have built a relationship with, that you can trust that you have their back, they have your back, you can be honest about those things. And the other side of that is, it's also a place where you get to use your spiritual gifts in a way that bless others in a small setting. Like a lot of times we think about living out our faith, you know, out on, on the airplane, sitting next to an atheist going somewhere, some person we've never seen or met. And we get intimidated by the thought of that when the truth of the matter is I, that's not realistic. You live out your faith in small places with your family, with your life group, with your church. And because you're able to do that in a small, safe space and you learn about your spiritual gifts and you use them in the life group setting or in the church setting, serving others, praying for others, teaching others, whatever the case might be, then in a larger sense, out in the world where it's difficult, where you'll be attacked, where you'll be made fun of, your faith is stronger because you've been able to do it in a small, safe setting. Look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. This is one of the places where Paul uses this analogy of, of being in Christ is like being a part of a body. In Romans 12, verse 3, he says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. So notice right off the bat that Paul is saying, This grace has been given to me, and I am sharing this with you. That's what the Christian life is supposed to look like. By the grace that God gives you, you share that with others. The love that God gives you, the mercy God gives you, the forgiveness God gives you, the kindness God gives you, you share that with others. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerful, cheerfulness. Paul is saying, because we're in Christ, we're automatically a part of the body of Christ. Like you can't say, well, I love Christ. I don't really like the church. I want to be in Christ. I want to be a part of Christ. I don't want to be a part of the church. It doesn't work that way. Scripture doesn't leave you that option. If you are in Christ, you are in the body of Christ, or collectively, you're in the church. And you are a part of a body, and you have a function. You have a spiritual gift that God uses for the benefit of that body. And that plays out worldwide, but it also plays out locally in the local church that the members there each have different abilities and gifts, but they use them for the benefit of the church and for one another. And a life group is almost like a, 
testing ground, for lack of a better term, where you can learn and use those gifts in a small, safe space and it makes it easier to do that on a bigger scale and, and out in front of the world. And here's the thing about, think about your body. You got all the different parts, right? But as, if I'm feeding myself, if I'm eating something, like if I take this hand and I put something in my mouth and I eat it, the nourishment from that, the benefit of that doesn't just go to this hand, right? It goes across the whole body. The benefit serves the whole body. As we use our gifts in small groups, in church, it benefits the entire body. And the body of Christ suffers when we, the members, are not doing that. If we're not using our gifts, if we're not serving, if we're not teaching, if we're not praying, if we're not studying, whatever the case might be, if we're not doing that, the body, the whole body, suffers as a result of that. And think about this. What happens when, I mean, let's say you hurt your ankle. You twist your ankle or something, you tweak your ankle. What's the first thing that starts happening? I'm talking about not, you know, like you got to go get a cast and that kind of stuff. You start limping, right? So you're limping around because your ankle hurts. And then next thing you know, I'm limping around, my ankle hurts, but golly, my, now my hip hurts on the other side because you're limping over here on this side and now this side's hurting. Then you keep on, you keep on, you never address it, you never address it, you're limping, golly, my ankle hurts and my hip hurts. Man, my back hurts, good grief. What's going on? I'm falling apart. I'm falling apart, things are just hurting. More things are happening. Why? Because your ankle had an injury. It wasn't taken care of, and then you're trying to compensate for it. Now it's hurting over here, and you're not trying to take care of that. Now you're compensating. Now this hurts. Oh, my goodness. And then you're hurting all over. That's the way it happens in your physical body. That's the way it happens in the spiritual body also. If you're the ankle, and you're not doing your part then you got to compensate for that. And that's how you end up with the whole thing of, you know, well, there's 10% of the people doing 90% of the work in every organization, everywhere. Y'all have all worked in a job and you're just like, well, we got 10 people working here. About three of us do the work. And the other, you know, there's two that don't do anything, but they're like the boss's nephew or son-in-law. And then there's three or four that they'll do something if you specifically tell them to. Y'all know how that is. Same thing happens in church. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. God gives each of us a gift. And he expects us, wants us, desires for us to use that gift. To serve others so that they can be encouraged. They can grow in their faithfulness so that God is glorified. It happens in small groups in a small, safe space in a way that it can't happen. It's physically impossible for it to happen in a large corporate space. God gives us grace. He gives us love. He gives us mercy so that we can share that with others. And life groups is a place to do that. So... Having said all that, first, if you're not a part of a life group, I'm sorry if you feel attacked this morning. That's not my point. I'm trying to show that there's benefits to that. And I, I, I could have really went to people that have been consistently a part of a life group, and we could have just marched them up here one by one, and maybe in different words, they would have still said the, the same thing. Maybe not as many words as I've used this morning. But they would say, no, yeah, it's been, it, being a part of a life group, I don't know how I got through whatever without my people. I don't know how this would have happened without this, this group of people. 
And when I'm struggling, I look forward to meeting with that group of people because I know they're going to have my back and they're going to pick me up. They're going to point me to Jesus. They're going to pray for me. All of those things happen in a life group. So here's my challenge to you. Next week, life groups will start back. The week of the 14th, that Sunday, Wednesday night on the 17th, youth stuff starts back, children's stuff, life groups start back. If you haven't been a part of one, I'm challenging you. Sign up for one. We'll, next week, we're going to have like a fair, I guess you'd say. We'll have information about each of the life groups, what the topics are and where they meet and when they meet and all that. Find one, sign up for it, stick it out for a semester. We go, what, about 12 weeks, roughly, 10 to 12 weeks. We take a break for spring break and all that. If at the end of that you go, all right, that group's not for me, then when the fall comes, go to another group. That's fine. I guarantee you nobody's going to have their feelings hurt. If you look at all that and you go, well, we've got life groups on this night and on this night, there's not a life group that's convenient for me. Well, then come talk to me, come talk to Matt. We've got like four consistent life groups in ARAB. There's more when you consider what's going on in the other campuses. We got four from this campus. We probably really, we probably really need at least two more right now, if we're honest, because you don't want to have 25 people in a life group. Then you lose all of that small, safe space that we're talking about. So if you look at that and you go, there's not one for me, and don't you, then don't use that as an excuse because there's not one that meets on a time that's convenient for you. Don't use that as an excuse to not go to a life group. Let's start another one. I guarantee you, if it's not convenient for you, there's others it's not convenient for, and another time might be better for more people. And Matt and I can help you with that. And you go, well, I don't know what to do. What do you normally do when you come up against something in your life and you go, I don't know what to do? Do you just ignore it? No, you go to somebody who knows what to do and you ask them. Or you go on YouTube <laughs> and you look up a video about how to do it. You're like, I don't know how to host a life group. Come talk to me. Come talk to Matt. We can point you in the right direction. I'm going to tell you, here's, here's, what, here's all you need to know about life groups. You need to have a set time. And you need to be there. Now, yeah, we could flesh it out a little bit more, but you need to have a set time. It needs to be the same time every, every time, and you need to be there. You can, you can use a book of the Bible. You can use a video. You can use something online. You can use a book. There's all kinds of different ways to do it. It's not that hard. And the benefits far exceed the anxiety that you feel or the, the hesitation that you feel. If you found somebody in this, this church that's been a part of a life group for a re, on the regular for the last semester or years or whatever, and you ask them, I guarantee you they would back up everything I'm saying this morning. And if you need more, Scripture backs it up also. So my challenge is, be a part of a life group this year, this spring. Take that step. Join in one of these life groups. Come with expectation of what the Lord can do in your life and through your life. Let's bow our heads. The worship team's going to come. We're going to get ready to sing one more song this morning. I don't know what um, I don't know what the Lord has said to you this morning. What you what you've been thinking about? What's been impressed upon you this morning? I do know this: God wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to show you grace. 
He wants to give you peace. He wants to grow you and change you to be more like Jesus. And through all of that, he wants to use you to do the same thing in other people's lives. He wants to use you to show people the love of Jesus. He wants to use you to show people the forgiveness of God, the peace of God that passes all understanding. He wants you to be able to go into your workplace and into your school, into your family settings, whatever the case might be. And he wants to use you to draw others to him, to spread the good news of Jesus Christ, that salvation is available in Jesus, that forgiveness is available in Jesus, that eternal life is available in Jesus, and that he is calling us to life and life more abundant. Don't wait. Don't put that off. Don't keep thinking, well, I'll do that next time. If you've never given your life to Christ, today is the day of salvation. Jesus paid the price for your sins, and all he asks is that you trust him. And in return, he will take your sins and he will give you himself. And you will stand before God, justified, a child of God. And then he gives you opportunities to change the lives of others, to show them that same love and grace and forgiveness. Make a decision, make a choice today to be committed to the things of God. Committed to be more like Christ and let God work through you to change you. God, I pray today, if anyone here that doesn't know you, hasn't trusted you, God, may today be the day that they just call out to you. That they acknowledge that you are God and that Jesus has paid the way, paid for our sins. And God, for those of us who have I don't know, maybe been slacking. Get caught up in the, the busyness of life and let the things of God slide into the background. God, may today be the day that we ask forgiveness for that. And that we, again, as in Acts 2, that we devote ourselves to the things of God. Thank you for your faithfulness, for your patience, for your peace. God, may we use that to point others to you. Thank you for the opportunity to not just be a child of God, but to be at work in the kingdom of God to draw others to you. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship him.